Hi, it's Whitney Kurtz Ogilvie, your friendly neighborhood writing specialist, and today I'm going to talk to you about writing an integrative literature review. So what's an integrative review? You might also hear this described as a narrative review. And the goal is to improve our understanding of a topic through a summary or a synthesis, would be a better word, of empirical and theoretical literature. So this can include experimental studies, non-experimental studies, you know, quantitative, qualitative research, and it can also sometimes include theoretical literature if it's relevant to the topic. They can concisely present a large body of evidence. They can, if they're comprehensive enough, present the current state of the science on a topic, and here's everything we know about this topic. They can be good to define concepts, define the scope of a problem, explore theory, so they have a, a fairly wide range of, of uses. And, you know, it, literature reviews are very useful for busy professionals, busy practitioners who don't have time to read all of the latest research as it comes out. So, you know, you can look at a literature review and you can see what's been done on your area of interest in the last five to ten years. So that's really useful because, you know, we're busy. We don't have time. Oh, hello. That's Pippin. We don't have time to read every study that comes out as it's published. They're also appropriate for critiquing a large or mature body of literature for synthesizing the literature to date on topics with limited or preliminary research, describing the development of a problem and its management. You see this one a lot, actually. Identifying studies that have flawed, design, flawed designs or flawed implementation, so they critique the available evidence as well as presenting it. And that's really important because we need to know whether the studies that are coming out on a topic are reliable, whether they're rigorous enough. So it can be helpful in identifying flawed research. So the basic format for an integrative review, and you will see different headings, and you will see people add, you know, an extra section sometimes, but this is just the, the skeleton. Different journals will have different requirements. Always read your author guidelines. So this is just a basic skeleton. But a basic skeleton for a lit review would be to start with a background section, and this is where we're going to explain what the topic is or what the problem is that we're investigating, and especially why it's important. Why should we care about this? What is the prevalence of the problem? What's the seriousness? What are the consequences of this problem if it goes untreated or unchecked? So um, the background section should conclude with a purpose statement. That is extremely important, and people will often leave out a purpose statement, but it's essential, especially in the lit review, because that's going to be the question or questions that guided your review of the literature. So what were you setting out to find out? So next would come method section, and this refers to your methods, not the methods of the studies that re you reviewed, but your own methods in searching and narrowing down the field of research to the relevant studies. So what databases did you use? What search terms did you use? What were your inclusion and exclusion criteria? So that's how did you narrow down, you know, if you put in search terms initially that were a little bit too broad, perhaps, and you ended up with 550 articles, how did you narrow those down to a manageable number. How many articles did you end up including in your review? How many articles did you review? So those are the kinds of things that go in your methods section in an integrative review. Now in a systematic literature review, which is almost like a research study in itself, the methods section might be a little bit more extensive because you want in a systematic review for people to be able to exactly replicate your methodology for reviewing the literature on this. And also sometimes systematic reviews will have what we call meta-analyses, which are statistical analyses of available evidence. Now an integrative review is usually not going to have that, but in a systematic review the methods would include the methods for that as well. So next would come your finding section, or sometimes called your results section. This is where you put your synthesis of the available evidence. So when you read all of these articles, what were the main points that emerged? What were the take-home messages? Next would come discussion. Now this is where you get at the so what question. The why is this important? And what do we do with this information? And it's where you analyze the findings. So what are the implications of these findings for practice, for further research? And what are the limitations of the evidence? So you're going to critique the evidence as well. Are there common flaws in this body of evidence? Are there problems with methods? Are there problems with sampling? Are there problems with interpretation of data? Um, all those sorts of things. 
And then last is your conclusion, and this is just like any other conclusion. It's a concise recapping of the main points and a look toward the future. So what should the next steps be? What's next? So that's a basic skeleton. Now, before you get started, it's wise to do some pre-writing. Before you start writing your review, you want to make sure you have a clear purpose and a clear picture of the problem that your paper will address. So again, purpose statement is really important and a strong purpose statement, which you will use in your paper's background or introduction, should define the scope of your review and provide readers with a rationale for why you wrote it. So why did you write this? Why did we need this research? Why is it important? So um, that's where you, if you had specific research questions that you set out to answer, you're going to put those in your purpose statement. It doesn't have to be phrased as a question, but you want it to be very clear what it was that you set out to investigate. It's also a good idea to try using an outline or a prospectus to plan your first draft, but you want to make sure that you don't allow yourself to get so married to your outline that you don't allow yourself the room to change your mind, experiment, change the, the focus if it needs to be changed. You want to make sure that you give yourself permission to go where the writing leads you. So if you feel like you would be too restricted by a traditional outline, try writing a prospectus instead. So a prospectus is like a few paragraphs long and it's just kind of an informal freeform plan for what you plan to write. What questions do you want answered? You know, how do you plan to go about this paper? And that might be better for some people. Just experiment and see what works for you. Now, I referred to here in um, some to some readings. This is because I originally made this PowerPoint for a class. You can just ignore that. But that does refer to an excellent book on writing literature reviews by M. Ling Pan. So if you are interested, you can check out that book. And I forget the title off the top of my head, but it has to do with writing literature reviews, obviously. And it's M. Ling Pan. So quite good. It's also a good idea to use your evidence table. And if you have not ever made an evidence table for a literature review before, you really should start. If you do a good enough job on your evidence table, this paper will write itself. So what an evidence table essentially is, is a table that's going to have a column for the title of the study and the authors. It's going to usually have a column for their methodology, you know, sample size and what kind of design was it and all that good stuff. It's going to have a column for what the main findings were. It's usually going to have a column for the limitations of the research. So this is the limitations that they listed in the limitations section of their own study. So what are their perceptions of their limits? And then um, a, a column for implications. So what were their impressions of what their findings meant for practice, for further research, etc. And then um, you may want to do a column also where you grade the evidence. So there the Cochrane Library and some other organizations have grading scales for evidence. And you can use those or you can leave that off if you don't want to use that. But I would definitely include methods, results, um, implications, and limitations, a column for each of those for every study that you look at. And if you do a good enough job with that, you can honestly just, when you get to your finding section and your discussion section, you can just look down the column, essentially, and you're going to, when you look down that results column, you're going to start to see themes emerge. You're going to start to see studies that have similar findings. You're going to start to see studies that have contradictory findings. And you're going to want to group similar findings together and highlight any contradictions. And that's what we mean when we say synthesis going to be much easier if you use that evidence table. Similarly, when you get to your discussion section and you're talking about the implications of all of these studies, you can look down that implications column and again, themes are going to start to emerge. Some common ideas are going to start to come out. When you go down that limitations column, the you're, you're going to see really easily if there are common limitations to this body of evidence. So for example, maybe you've got 15 studies and they all had small sample sizes or most of them did. So one thing you can put in your limitations is, you know, we've never had a study on this that had a really large sample size. Or maybe the participant demographics have been really limited. Or maybe the settings have been 
you know, not ideal or whatever. But if you look down that limitations column, you're going to be able to see that very easily. So it just makes it so much easier. It does a lot of the work for you. So highlight those themes when you find them. And you can use color coding. And I'm a massive nerd for color coding. I love to color code stuff. So you can have highlighter pens and print out that evidence table. And you can go down and you can highlight similar findings. So you'll remember which studies agreed with each other. And you can highlight which studies contradicted those. And it's really going to be extremely useful. Now the next slide wasn't my own. It's from the Walden University Writing Center's website and they have a wonderful presentation on lit reviews and that's where I got this slide. So part of synthesizing is that you want to organize your literature review by theme or by finding rather than by study. So what I mean there is you're not going to want to start a paragraph with saying a study by Jones and Doe found this and then a study by Wu and Rodriguez found this. You're not going to do that. You're not going to go study by study by study. That is what you would do if you were writing an annotated bibliography, which is just a summary of every study. That's not what we're doing in a literature review. A literature review is a synthesis, not a summary. It's a thematic review. So instead, you're going to go theme by theme or finding by finding. And this is just an example of that. So on the left, we have some notes from our research or some information from our evidence table. So we've got author A study has to do with single moms, working parents, and wage gaps. Author B has a study about child care cost increases and daycare demographics. And study C has information about parent-child relationships and the role of caregivers. So we've got all these different studies. Now what could we do to pull themes out of that? So we have our thematic outline over here on the right. So authors A and B both looked at financial costs to single parenting. Authors B and C both looked at socioeconomic status and parenting styles. And authors A and C both had to do with working and raising children. So we're starting to pull themes out rather than just going study by study by study. And the reason for that really is twofold. The first reason is that if you went study by study, you'd have a lot of unnecessary repetition because you're going to usually find that multiple studies will say the same thing or have similar findings. There's no need to go through and give ex exhaustive detail about every one of those. The other reason is that it's very useful to readers to get what I would call a bird's eye view of a body of evidence. So rather than just presenting each piece of the puzzle individually, you want to put that jigsaw together and describe the picture that it makes. Okay, so that's the difference between a study by study organization and a thematic organization. So you might also want to take some time to view my presentation, Keys to a Successful Paper. Now, if you're watching on YouTube, this is also a workshop that I give on this channel. Originally, this was made for a class I was teaching, so disregard what it says about Canvas. But you can watch that presentation on my YouTube channel because it gives a lot of good advice that's going to apply to literature reviews as well as to really anything else you're writing. So how to write a good introduction and purpose statement, how to ensure a smooth, logical organization of ideas, Ideas, how to write a strong conclusion, all that good stuff is good to do before you start writing your review. Now once you begin drafting, once you actually begin writing the review, you're going to fill in your headings and subheadings first because that's going to help keep you focused and help you remember what all you have to include. It's a good idea too to write your purpose statement or your research question or questions on a sticky note and actually slap it up on the wall next to your computer or on your computer monitor so that that's going to keep you focused as you go. It's going to help you not fall down too many rabbit holes. And I always tell people, allow yourself one perfectionism-free draft before you start editing yourself. We all have that mean little gremlin that sits on our shoulder and tells us, that's stupid, don't say it like that, nope, don't go there, that's not what we're talking about. Shut that guy up for the first run-through, okay? Just while you're writing your first draft, tell that guy to, to zip it. And it's going to give you the freedom to experiment a little bit and get all your ideas out. And then you can go back later and, and edit yourself and take out anything that doesn't work. But you don't want to limit yourself in that early invention stage of writing. It's also a good idea to make sure to cite as you write. Don't think that you're going to remember who said what and what came from what source. Oh my gosh, that's just asking for unintentional plagiarism. So cite your sources as you write. 
Try to use more than one reference to support a point, especially important points, but you don't have to cite everything you have on a topic. We don't want a parenthetical citation with 15 things in it because people are just going to stop reading. It's going to take up too much of your paragraph.